When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy that would like to remind everyone entering the garage that there's a $5 charge for whining. He is the captain. And there's a $1,000 charge if you're the colonel. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Fresh out the fridge, we have You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown Ale by Santa Cruz Mountain Brewing. Garage grade, three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown Ale is brewed with roasted malts and features aromas of toasted caramel. It's brewed with English ale yeast for a nice, crisp, and classic finish. And today's beer was brought to us by these classically awesome friends right here. First up, we have Meredith in Spring City, Tennessee. Yeah, if I created a beer, it would be called Use a Piece of Shit, Charlie Brown. Next up, we have Kelly in St. Petersburg, Florida. And a nice jibby jib jib to Cheryl in Henderson, Nevada. Next, we have Connie in Parts Unknown. We have Miss Myra in Nowheresville. And last but not least, we have Michelle, who I'm guessing is in Springfield because she recommends Mother's Brewery, which I... I'm almost certain, Captain, we have recommended them before on this show. I believe so, my kind sir. Thanks, everybody, for filling up the fridge for this week's show. And make sure you check out the store page because we have the Zodiac hoodies. You have to order them by the 7th. They ship out on the 14th. So, yes, you should receive them by Christmas. And that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Many have told the story of Edmund Kemper, but you've never heard it quite like this before. Most of the information in this case is well known, but I will lay some of it out here. Edmund Emil Kemper III was raised by a mother that even when he was just a small boy, she very likely hated him. Edmund liked to play death ritual games with his sister. He tried living with his father, but he didn't want him either. He grew to be a large man and extremely intelligent. Ed was about six foot nine inches tall and his IQ near genius level. Some call him the ogre of Aptus. As an adult, he was convicted of the mutilation slayings of eight women. Was this hulking monster born evil 
or was he made evil? This week, we will study Edmund and those who have studied him before. We will try to learn about the angry little boy that lives inside this giant homicidal man. This is a look at the murderous madness of Edmund Kemper, the co-ed killer. Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's not. It's far more than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Uh, how he, many? she didn't give up. I did. I came in out of the cold. And what I'm saying is there are some people who prefer it in the cold. You were able to appear like a ordinary person, non-threatening to... I lived as an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. The True Crime Garage Army loved the hit series Mindhunter, the show based on the real-life events of the genesis of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit housed at FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. On Mindhunter, the main characters Holden Ford and Bill Tench are essentially the dramatized on-screen versions of famous real-life FBI agents John Douglas and Bob Ressler. Like on the show and like in real life, these agents worked in a special unit of the FBI that had many objectives, but two of the most important were helping local law enforcement agencies solve crimes and studying the new phenomenon at the time, which was the realization of the significant increase of stranger-on-stranger crimes, serial offenders, and serial killers, which are both terms now often used, but back then, serial offender and serial killer were new terms both coined by the special agents working with this unit at the FBI. This week, we will be discussing serial killer Edmund Kemper, who spent a lot of time talking with the FBI over the years. The general topics of discussion, who was he, what crimes did he commit, and why? The first series of Mindhunter features some of these dramatizations of these talks with Kemper and the FBI. Now, we both watched season one and loved it, and one thing... We have discussed on our show off the record, and I say this almost shamefully, Captain, we both loved actor Cameron Britton as serial killer Edmund Kemper. Heck, sometimes during breaks, we, when working, we would stop the show, and we both were doing Kemper impressions. I particularly liked the scene when they were talking about the horrible murders Kemper has committed, and he's offering the agents another slice of pizza. Now, this is disturbing on several levels because while I'm watching the show and thinking to myself, I could listen to Ed Kemper talk for days, then the realization comes back to you, kicks you in the teeth with the reminder that Ed Kemper was a despicable human being. He's a monster, and yet I find him somewhat charming. And some might be saying, well, that's the TV version of Ed, Colonel, and it is, but if you and we have watched interviews with the real Ed Kemper, it's very similar. So we felt bad about that, but we're not alone in our liking of the TV version of Kemper because actor Cameron Britton did win an Emmy for his work on the show. Yeah, well, and some of the lines that they use in the show are direct lines from the interviews that were recorded. So let's go to the real-life version of the Genesis of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit and case study of Edmund Kemper. Now, interviewing serial killers. So it was it was John Douglas that suggested to Bob Ressler that since there were so many serial killers locked up, that they should start talking to them to see if they would talk about what they had done and why they believed that they did it. 
one just like you hear earlier with the pizza offering the pizza the FBI would offer them a special meal like hey if you interview with us we can get you a pizza or we can get you some specialty sub or something that you can't get in prison well Bob Ressler agreed with Douglas and they decided that they were going to start interviewing these guys and actually they decided that while they were in California helping law enforcement to start there because as we all know from the various cases we have covered here in the garage California has certainly had its more than fair share of weird crimes and serial killers. Yeah. So this was 1978, and they're going to go interview their first serial killer, and they decided to start with Ed Kemper. Ed was housed at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville, California. They decided their best method of going about this was to show up unannounced and without permission from the FBI and without giving the prison prior notice as well. So... This is for two reasons. One, the FBI believes, these guys believe the FBI would have told them, no, you can't go around interviewing serials. Right. And two, they also believed if the meeting was scheduled with the inmate, that the inmate would likely be considered a snitch by the other prisoners, thus possibly putting their subject in danger and making them far less likely to cooperate and agree to these interviews. So if they showed up unannounced, the other inmates would just assume that they simply were investigating a case or investigating something or other. Now, we have to consider how terrifying this could be, even for federal agents. First, they can't go in there with their gun or weapon. You know, they don't want those things working their way into the you know population. Right. And second, they have to sign waivers agreeing that if they were to be taken hostage at any time, that they understood that they would not be bargained for. Well, on both of these men, they're going to go in as a pair. So both of these men are trained, but Ed is also 6'9". That's a big boy. Yeah, basically locked alone in a room with a 6 foot 9 inch tall, almost 300 pound man. And then another thing that Douglas was concerned about was the IQ of Edmund Kemper. Now, I got to be honest with you here, Captain. I've seen this IQ kind of all over the shop. I've seen it listed as high as 146 and as low as 131. Yeah, or 31. <laughs> well, I, I do know that he was tested at least twice, so that might be the cause of some of these uh, variations. I also understand that there's multiple versions of the what we would just call the IQ test, which could give a different score, so to speak. So kind of like credit scores, there's different top levels of different credit scores. Yes. And so we have Douglas who he thought to himself, and I'm sure he discussed this with wrestler in advance. He was a little worried that, you know, these guys are used to being the smartest guys in the room. And now they're in there with this giant and they're worried that he's smarter than them, you know, so physically he could overpower them Mentally, he might be able to manipulate them or to bullshit them, to put it quite frank. Right. But like I said, both these guys are trained individuals. These guys have made it to the FBI. So they've dealt with some of the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, yeah. So they're going to, I mean, but just imagine if you're not trained at all, right? Some of these police officers have taken criminals that have done heinous crimes and they had to lock them up, uh, handcuff them put them in the backseat of their car and transport them to another prison or to another jail by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, this is a, this sounds crazy to us to go, Hey, you're going to go into this little still cage with this uh, killer. But, I, but I also think these guys are, are a lot tougher than, uh, that maybe he gave them credit for. Well, you and I discussed, um, Wickline, which was a somebody that was put to death here in, in Ohio for a couple of murders. Yeah. And Wickline was a large man. He was, he was quite strong as well, and he was intelligent too. Um, he was not as big as Edmund Kemper. His IQ was probably not as high as Edmund Kemper's. And, and he, he was a guy that, you know, we spoke to several officers that said, I knew guys that had to transport him. I knew guys that had to be in a room with Wickline and they told, they went to their superiors in advance and said, I refuse to be alone with him. Right. If I'm going to be in a room or in a car with this guy, there better be multiples. Uh, you know, there better be 
a bunch of good guys and only one wick line. So the thing with, uh, you know, and like you said, these guys are trained. These guys are skilled individuals. Douglas was a, um, I believe he was a boxer in, in college, you know, so, so a bit of a tough guy, I guess. But, yeah. I mean, this look, if you're a trained boxer and then you have to, you had to deal with the scum of the earth, those guys aren't, a, they're not afraid of this guy. But keep in mind just the reach alone on Ed Kemper. I mean, six foot nine. Yeah, but you know the difference between a normal human and a and an actual trained boxer. Like the, anytime somebody says, "Hey, I, I trained as a boxer," you don't want to fight that guy. Right. That guy knows how to throw a punch. The thing, though, too, that that's tough for us regular civilians to get over is just the idea of forget about his size or his intelligence. But just the idea of being in a room with somebody that you know is not only capable of murder, but according to the case file, it tells you that he enjoyed it. Yeah, and I'm not trying to put a damper on this, but I also think some of the psychological um, warfare on this is, you know, Ed 6'9", he kills women. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like he just killed anybody and everybody. Right. You mean you mean he's not like like Russell Crowe entering the uh, Coliseum yeah, and he's fighting not, lions? Right, right. Yeah. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? So the John Douglas and Bob Wrestler they were interested really and in, truly in anything that Kemper wanted to tell them. But per the unit's study, they were primarily interested in getting answers to the following questions. One, what leads a person to become a serial sexual offender and what are the early warning signals? Two, what serves to encourage or to inhibit the commission of his offense? Three, what types of response or coping strategies by an intended victim are successful with what type of sexual offender in avoiding victimization? Four, what are the implications for his dangerousness prognosis, disposition, and mode of treatment. All right, so question for you, because if you watch Mindhunter, they don't really have questionnaires or really much of a objective at the beginning, or that's at least what the show portrays. Mm -hmm. So do you think that this was the first, the first things that they're trying to get answered and then that developed more later? Um, I think that probably that between the two of them, John Douglas and Bob Ressler, that this was their primary goal right from the onset of everything. Right. I just don't think that they put pen to paper to come up with an effective strategy. So according to the show, the TV show, and what I think we can kind of infer from the show is, like you said, they come up with basically a questionnaire. Hey, here's kind of a script to not share with the subject, but between the two of you, you know that you're working to get answers to these set of questions. Right, but that script happened once they got a doctor involved. Correct. And I think what that the whole genesis of that would be and where the smarts of that comes into play is these guys were extremely busy. And what I mean by that is when this first started, they weren't being paid to or their superiors didn't even understand that they were out interviewing these serial killers. They were actually supposed to be there on other business. They're training local law enforcement agencies on how to detect and deduce certain crimes. They're also working with local law enforcement agencies to actually solve crimes. So while they happen to be in the neighborhood, so to speak, they're like, okay, well, what prison is nearby and who is locked up for life? Or, you know, and let's go talk to them. Yeah, and both of these guys were also original members of New Kids on the Block. So they had a lot of stuff going on. So most of the time in the beginning until they got their um, grant money, they were doing this on their own time in the evenings and on the weekends. So I think the script and I think putting together a list of actual questions is really just a way to maximize their time and their efficiency while they're there talking to him. You've watched plenty of interviews with Ed Kemper. You, you know, it's obvious he can just talk and talk and talk and talk for hours and hours and hours. When he graduated, he was most likely to have a podcast <laughs> in, in his high school class. So the, the interesting thing here, though, is you asked, do you believe that 
these were were questions that they saw answers to right from the beginning. Yeah, just because if I'm wrong, it, it made it seem like we don't know what to expect, so let's just go in there and see if we could get him talking. I think that's the truth. I think that's the truth on some level. We do know that this was their objective um, because this was later released many years later. This was after they got their grant money. It's kind of to champion their cause, so to speak. They released these sets of questions. Hey, this is what we're looking for when we interview these guys in an FBI news bulletin to the rest of their uh, department in their agencies. I'm confusing real life with the TV show, but also in this TV show, wasn't the first meeting a solo meeting where he actually didn't go in with his partner? Well, that's a dramatization. In real life, there were three individuals that sat down with Ed Kemper the first time. Um, and I don't know the name of the other um, officer involved. And I can, and to be honest with you, I think it was a local FBI agent. You know, Douglas in wrestler, not local to the area. Right. I think that that FBI agent probably worked because they had not been in a prison yet. And they didn't know that, hey, you could just walk up with and flash your FBI badge. And most of the time that works to get into the prison. Right. Well, because a lot of these prison guards or local officers had a lot of respect for the FBI. Well, think about two of the questions that, that they listed there within those four. You know, and they're all kind of lengthy questions. If you really dissect them, each one is actually multiple questions worked into one question. Right. But the simplicity of it is two things. One, what is the early warning signals of who this person could turn into be? I know the answer. Too much flicky flicky. And then two, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. What can a victim do? If you find yourself caught up with an individual like this, a serial killer, serial rapist, what can I do to try to get myself out of this situation? And behavioral wise, you know, are there things that I can say, things that I can do? Are there actions I can take or reactions to this madman that I can use to, to save my own life and get me out of this situation? Right. Cause what we've seen with Bundy, you're going to see with Kemper, you're going to see with other serial killers that they will have, moments where everything you know this plan that normally takes place normally these serial killers it's like after the first attack or the second attack then they start going well this is how i'm going to do it this is my ruse to get them in my car Mm -hmm. then we go here then we drive this and then we do this and then i pull my gun on them and they kind of have a routine that they're building but there's also times where it's like uh, my routine was to pick pick up a hitchhiker or my routine was to pick up a sex worker and they will do that and they just drop the individual off and there is no murder. Right. So what made those different than the actual attacks? The simplicity of both of those questions and actually, in my opinion, almost all four of those questions is really early detection of a serial killer and preventing more loss of life. You know, we have, how can a victim get out of this situation? One, as law enforcement, you want a victim to get out of the situation, not only to save their own life, but to help you solve the crime, help you make an arrest. Somebody that could later identify somebody that did something terrible to them, or at least attempted to do so. And then we have the early warning signals, you know, the early signs of, of the creation of the serial killers. If I could just interject for a second. This has been on my mind all morning, but we're talking about serial killers, so it's relevant, okay? Don't give me those eyes. Big shout-out to Bill Burr, the comedian. I was watching his show last night, his uh, cartoon show on Netflix, F is for Family, and there's a scene where he's arguing with this kid, and he starts fighting the kid, Mm -hmm. and then the dad comes up, and he's like, what are you you doing? You're trying to fight my nine-year-old son. You, what what are you, some kind of asshole, right? And then mm-hmm. you notice that the guy's name on his uh, name badge that's fighting Bill Berg's her- character, his last name is Dahmer. And mm-hmm. he's, then he starts calling his son Jeffrey. <laughs> and the kid has blonde hair with the little glasses. And I just thought, I, I can't, one, I can't get away from true crime. But how clever it is that he just kind of threw it in there. Like, I wonder how many people watched that and didn't even know that it was Jeffrey Dahmer. And true crimes kind of seeped its way into 
all different kinds of media. Well, and the fact too that like the cartoon is based around that time period where Jeffrey Dahmer would have been mm. a child. Okay. Okay. Well, but a key thing to keep in mind when talking to these serial killer types, um, and we've touched on this a bit already, is that they are often skilled manipulators and some of them quite intelligent, which as is the case with Kemper. So it was it was and is extremely important that the FBI agents know the case inside and out in order to hopefully get the answers to the questions and to advance the FBI's ability to prevent, detect, and capture serial offenders and serial killers. Now, the agents are going to want to learn everything they can about Kemper's childhood, environment, relationships, crimes, habits, and his arrest. But they're going to want to know this in his own words, right from his mouth. And when we come back, we will talk about some of the things that they learned. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there. Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase. I watched her social life drop off. I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such uh, into one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked what she coveted what was important to her and i was destroying it why did you actually kill the girls my frustration my inability to communicate socially sexually i wasn't impotent but emotionally i was impotent i was scared to death of failing in male female relationships i knew absolutely nothing about that whole area even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women. 
and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides. This fantastic passion. Uh, it was overwhelming me. It was like drugs. It was like alcohol. A little isn't enough. At first it is. And as you adjust to that, psychologically and physically, you take more and more and more. It's the same process. So it finally came down to the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realizing if that gun comes out, something has to happen. Edmund Emil Kemper III was born December 18, 1948 in Burbank, California. Now, during his childhood, Kemper was physically and emotionally abused by his alcoholic mother, Clarnell who was divorced from his father. Before the divorce, Ed was close with his father. After the divorce, Ed's mother hated him, and it's believed this is because Ed looked almost exactly like his father. One of Ed's favorite games to play as a boy was a game that he invented in which he called it Gas Chamber or The Gas Chamber. This would be a game that he played with his sister where they would take turns basically pretending to be gassed or gassing one another and then he would writhe around pretending to be in pain on the floor as he's pretending to die because of this uh, game that they were playing. Now, why Clarnell and Ed's two sisters slept upstairs, she made her son at the age of just eight years old sleep in the dark and cold basement alone at night. This is likely that she did this for many reasons, but the reason most often cited for this treatment or abuse was she was afraid Ed would molest or rape one of his sisters. So, and we've heard in several interviews, Ed described this and he describes it in a way that makes you really realize how uh, tormenting this was for him. This was a form of some kind of psychological abuse because he was afraid to be in the basement by himself. Right. But there was there any evidence that he would do this or is this just a, a made up nonsense fear by his mother? Oh, that he would rape or molest the sister. Right. That's a really good question. And I've, I, this is the thing that I have often wondered about because now let's say you're his mother. You're now in a situation where much later in life, this is projected as being a form of abuse and torment that you instilled on only one child out of three. Right. You kind of signaled out this dude, singled out this dude and put him through hell. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like a Cinderella situation, right? Treat one bad and the other good. Well, but you hit on something important here. What if there is some type of evidence that he would have molested or maybe even raped his sister? Yeah. Then in a sense, you're preventing the torture or abuse of another of your children. You see what I mean? By putting him in the basement. Well, right. And you're not putting him out in a shed. Right. But now this is also the fifties. So the basement, they're not what basements are now. The basements must've been terrible in the fifties. Right. And they're probably wet. And I, I heard also that he could hear rats, possibly. Yeah, so the thing, when we talk about Edmund Kemper here, that we should be completely clear about regarding this story is that there has been variations of his childhood and variations of his story throughout the years. I do wonder what is fact and what is fiction after all these years have passed. I do know from an interview that he gave, he described sleeping in the basement and described it simply as every night he would go down. He, you know, he would, he would walk down the stairs. Right. So picture like an old rickety wooden staircase. He would walk down the stairs and there was a single light at the bottom of the staircase. And he would, you know, it has the string hanging from it. He would reach up and he would pull the string to turn it on. And then he said that, that would only light up basically that corner of the basement. Right. Well, he slept in the far corner away from that. 
So he would walk all the way because he was afraid of being in the dark in the basement by himself. Well, that was that's the age where your mom says, go get the a towel out of the basement. And you go, okay. And then you brave the courage. It's middle of the day, and you turn on the light, and then you grab the towel. And now you have to turn off the light, but you have to run up the steps because mm-hmm. you're so afraid that something's going to grab you. Right. So he would walk the length of the basement, basically, to the other end where there was another light hanging, and he would put, you know, with a string, and he would pull the string and turn that light on, and then he would walk all the way back to turn off the light that was near the stairs. And he, there, most reports and stories would say that he was locked in the basement every night. I don't know if that, in fact, is true because his own words state that he, he, was in charge of closing the the basement door. Uh, he actually references that he would get yelled at by his mom because of the the cold would seep up into the house uh, if he didn't close the basement door and she didn't want to feel the cold. <laughs> that's, that's so nice of her. I don't know if he could hear rats. You know, the, that's the other rumor was that he could hear the rats scratching around in the night. Yeah, or if that was just made up in his head. Yeah, or or if it's just a story to make it worse than what it actually was. In all reality, let's say there were no rats. At the very least, we have an eight-year-old boy, somebody who's very young, um, mentally young as well, emotionally young, sleeping by himself in a dark, cold basement to which... It's so cold that he's required to shut the door so the cold doesn't seep into the rest of the house. And at the very least, in the middle of the night, he's going to hear the furnace turning on and off. Uh, So there would be noises that would probably startle him and wake him up or scare him throughout the night. Right. And on top of that, why are you there? Mm -hmm. Why are you in the basement? If you know it's because your mother fears this, then it's like, and again, if there's no evidence that you're going to do this or even capable of doing that, do you then become capable of doing it because you are essentially being accused of being capable of doing it? Well, the other thing too, Captain, is it is no question that his mother was an alcoholic. So there could be a skewed perception on her behalf as to what was going on in her home if she was drunk or under the influence a lot of the time while she was home. But Kemper did engage in psychotic and psychopathic behavior early on. So he started off by dismembering his sister's dolls. Uh, This was all based around a violent fantasy that he would later tell us about uh, killing his mother and his sisters. Now, one book describes this scenario pretty simply in something, something like this stating that as Ed sat awake in the cold, dark basement at night and his hatred grew and grew, he fantasized about killing the females upstairs. So right, because he's less than right. And they they made him less than, but also just because your son rips apart your daughter's baby, you know, or Barbie dolls. eh, I don't know if that's a sign of anything. The fact that he is stating that it was a replication of how he would murder his family. Now that's, that's a whole different level, but a kid just ripping apart a doll. That's sometimes boys will just be boys. Yeah. And he said that he started off by like popping off their heads, you know? So like if you picture like a a Barbie doll or any kind of doll, they usually have like that plastic head uh, connected to a much stiffer, stronger, sturdier plastic body. And he says, you know, he would get like pleasure from hearing that, that noise when he would pull the head from the body. Right. Well, later he said that he actually believes he even received some kind of, or or got some kind of sexual arousal by doing this. And look, I'm just going to put this question out now because we're going to be talking a lot about his viewpoints on things. And again, this is, this is also hindsight. Is he just making some of this stuff up? later in life to make him seem more interested. I mean, this is a guy that wants to talk. He wants to be heard. He wants people to listen to him. Are they more likely to listen to you if you're coming up with these interesting scenarios? Mm -hmm. Well, and here's captain where I think we should probably drop a bit of a warning for the listeners. Um, as we're going to get into a couple of things that I know some people don't like to hear about. And this is, typical behavior of a lot of these serial killers. So some of you might want to just kind of fast forward about a minute, minute and a half or so. 
So one of these behaviors that Kemper, Kemper was showing us as a, as a young man uh, when he was a teenager, early in his teen years, this included the torture and killing of animals. Now, the family had two cats. One of them he buried alive, and he later dug it up, and would he stored the carcass of the cat in a closet in their house. And then the second cat he killed with a machete. So this is a different situation, much different. One buried alive, the other he's actually physically attacking it with a machete to the point of he's getting blood on himself during the course of killing this animal. Right, but this is a huge step up from dismembering dolls. Yes, and actually, I found this quite interesting. Some psychologists say that cats are the most killed animals by these young, later-to-be serial killers because of a couple of psychological reasons. One, most, by far, most serial killers are men. And many have suggested that the cat on some psychological level is representative of the female gender. Right. And that a lot of these guys kill for their hate of a single female or of all of the gender. Well, I think you see this with uh, Dahmer. You also saw with the cat torture videos of Luca Magnata, AKA Puka Nahada. But in that scenario with the Luca Magnata case, his victim was, was a male. Yeah, and so that's that's why they believe that cats are usually, you know, we see the torture of different animals. We we certainly did when we talked about BTK and as you mentioned several others, but uh it seems to be that cats are the most often killed by these guys. Now, this is a good time for us to introduce what the mind hunter guys would refer to as the homicidal triad. Well, hold on. Uh, this is a good time to apologize for people that we probably should have said two and a half minutes. Fast forward two and a half minutes. So you probably caught that tail in and we're sorry about that. Yeah. So the, the homicidal triad, as the mind hunter guys would later come up with, this is after years of studying these serial killers and interviewing them and coming up with and getting information straight directly from them. Right. Um, so these behaviors, these three behaviors that we would see time and time again in the childhood of these eventual serial killers are these three types of, of things. One, fire starting, two, bedwetting, and three, cruelty to animals. I'm a fire starter, twisted fire starter. I, I, I. So um, with Ed, Edmund, um, is he wet in the bed? Is he making the wet basement wetter? I don't know about wetting the bed or fire starting, but we do know he was doing the cruelty to animals. But this is, I mean, throughout their studies, this is something that they would see enough to the point that they came up with a name for it, the homicidal triad. And this is something that they would see out of these serial killers where they would often exhibit one or two or all three of these behaviors during their, the course of their childhood. Well, there's different levels too of like pyromaniacs. I mean, when you're a kid, especially a young boy and you get a a box of matches or you get a lighter, you're going to light every toy that you can on fire. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes you're hanging out with one of your buddies and they're like to the extreme And I think that's kind of what they're talking about. There's always going to be somewhat of a fascination, especially with little boys playing with lighters or matches. Yeah, yeah. So people out there listening shouldn't freak out if they've experienced some. I would freak out if your son or daughter is doing the cruelty to animals thing. That seems to me to be a different level. Um, But like you said, some kids play with fire. Some some kids wet the bed. I mean, right. Um, and I don't know how much, I think years later, um, I'm curious to see how much they think the bedwetting is actually involved because it's not, that's not a destructive behavior when you compare it to the other two, you know, it's not a destructive behavior at all. Did you have a wetting of the bed problem? Well, but they're talking about, seems like you're defending this one. No, I'm not defending any of it. What I'm saying is it, they, what they mean by bedwetting is of, of a considerable older age. Right. You know, if you have a three-year-old kid and they're wet in the bed, sometimes they're just a three-year-old kid. Right. Um, anyway, it's what we do know is Edmund grew up to hate his mother 
And at the age of 14, he ran away from home. This is in search of his father. And he finds his father in Van Nuys, California. So when he caught up. He was looking for a better basement. Well, when he caught up with his father, his father had a new family and he didn't want Edmund staying with them. So Kemper said just him being around gave his stepmother migraine head headaches. So he was shipped off to go live with his father's parents on a 17 acre farm in North Folk, California. Yeah. But can you imagine though? Okay. Let's say you're not. Well, okay. Say you are married. And then you bring your son around and your wife is saying, I get migraines. Mm -hmm. This kid gives me migraines. Mm -hmm. You really going to pick this Looney Tune over your son? Well, you got to keep in mind, he's already chose to not choose his son. He's, he's right. not been living with That's, his son. Yeah. He's already walked away from that job and from that responsibility. And that's why. Yeah, but you also see, I wonder what the actions were between or what kind of relationship was there violence or anything between uh, Kemper's mother, father. What, what was their dynamic like? Because if she is, you know, this alcoholic Looney Tune, then you'd think on some level, okay, yeah, I didn't choose you then, but hey, things are probably pretty bad for you, so maybe I should do something. Well, he would have had a good idea, and when I say he, I mean Edmund's father would have had a good idea because I believe his, and I don't remember the exact words, but something something similar to this, he stated that being with Clarnell, with Edmund's mom, was worse than the time he spent fighting in the war. And he was, from my understanding, like he referred to his time in the war. He was in, in served, I don't know which war it was, but he served over a year in combat to what he referred to as suicide missions. And he said being with her was worse and more frightening than being in those suicide missions. See, there you go. So you would have to. So you're, you're a bit, yeah, but well, here's my point though. It's worse than a suicide mission, and that's what you're putting your eight-year-old son through? In his opinion, yes. And then when your son finally shows up and leaves there yeah. and says, look, I didn't like living there, so I've, I, I sought you out. I came and I found you. I do have to give some, some credit here. Um, you know, I'm not liking Edmund's father at all. I don't. I don't. See, he sounds like a. He's a piece of shit. I don't appreciate him not being around for Edmund's childhood or for taking the responsibility of being a real father. But what I will give him credit for is sending him to his parents' home rather than shipping him back to Clarnell. All right. So he's a piece of shit, but you a little less piece of shit because you sent him with your parents. Well, he probably figured, hey, if I can't raise you here, then uh -huh. I'm going to look. I turned out. Yeah, you know, maybe he considers he turned out pretty fine and he maybe he has good fond memories of his childhood and thought, well, I'll send you to go live with my parents. Can you imagine what this country would be like or what this world would be like if if every man actually manned up and raised their kids? Well, that's a big portion of of the study into these serial killers and why I said that we'll take a look at this situation and try to figure out if Edmund Kemper was born evil or if he was made to be evil because th the very simplistic thought of a serial killer is this, that they cannot have, and, and you can email me, you can hit me up on the blog, you can do whatever you want, but you, it would be tough to convince me otherwise for a person to knowing and willingly and plan out the murder of multiple people of multiple individuals they cannot have the same or share the same emotions that quote unquote normal people have. So why don't they have the same emotions as we do? What about, is that excluding like soldiers? Well, again, that's th that to me is a different situation. A serial killer is a very, um, defined type of, of person and killer. Okay. Where a soldier is a different definition of a killer. Technically, they both are still, they both are killers, but there are, there are huge differences between the two. So again, 
why don't they? So then the question then becomes, why don't they have the same emotions? Why don't they have the same responses as we would to their environments and to behaviors around them and to treatments that they're receiving? And right. this, when you go back and you really get to probably the simplest form of this is, does it start with being a little baby? And does it start with having a mother that didn't want you and having a father that wasn't there and not developing those emotions and not, of you know, developing right. those uh, behaviors, empathy, and not, not developing empathy at a very young age. Well, and also not in that. It doesn't always have to be that order. Sometimes it's the mother that rejects them and the father is still around, but he is just uh, not so such a great father. Mm -hmm. So there, I think you see it happen multiple ways. Yes. And, and not all serial killers had a horrible time growing up, a horrible childhood, but some of them did. And I do understand that there are a lot of people out there that had bad childhoods. Because look, if if everybody out there that had a, a bad, a quote unquote, what they have determined to be a bad childhood, right, grew up to kill people in the double digits in the you know ten or more people, yeah, we would be running out of people on this planet. So it's I'm not saying it's an excuse; it's more of a question of why and how. All right, so his father ships him off to live with his parents. Yes, on a 17 acre farm in North Folk, California. And it seems like Ed got along well with his grandfather, but not so much with his grandmother. Uh, his grandmother was a bit of a strict disciplinarian. His grandparents got him a 22 rifle for Christmas for small game hunting. There are differing stories about what I'm about to tell you, but the simple truth of it is this, that on August 27th, 1964, 15-year-old Edmund Kemper used his Christmas present to shoot his grandmother in the back three times as she sat at the kitchen table typing. Afterwards, he stabbed her three times with a kitchen knife. This is because he says that he didn't want her to suffer. He wanted to end it for her as quickly as possible. The reason being for killing his grandmother He's stated over the years that there's been several reasons, but the one that he cites the most often is he wanted to see what it would feel like. So his grandfather was out. It was not home during the time when he killed his grandmother. And the reason why I say there are differing stories about this is because there's the way that these stories go is either his grandfather was out in town shopping and then returned home or he was out hunting and the Ed was mad that he could not go or upset that he could not go hunting with his grandfather. Well, if his grandfather in fact wasn't out hunting, then we know he wasn't mad about that. Right. Regardless when his grandfather returned to the home, as Ed would describe it, they had a brief interaction where his grandfather waved to him. You know, he's getting out of his truck and he waves to him and like I said, it seems like the two of them had had a good relationship. Yeah. And Ed waited till his grandfather turned his back and he shot his grandfather. He would later then hide the body in a closet. And he said that he shot his grandfather for reasons that all seemed to stem from not wanting him to have discovered that that he had just killed his grandmother. Yeah, maybe not wanting him to see the body, maybe not wanting him to be disappointed and, and Kemper. Yeah, probably several things here. So not wanting him to be angry at Ed or upset with Ed, disappointed in Ed, as you had said, or also at the, the loss of life of his wife. Right. You know, his longtime companion. The weird thing, though, here, Captain, and we've actually heard this with several other serial killers, and, and I'll reference BTK uh, as a prime example here is Edmund immediately felt like at any time, a whole bunch of people were going to come to get him. Like everybody in the whole world probably knew what he had just done and that they're going to come up there. They're going to arrest him. They're going to attack him. They're going to kill him. Any number of those things. Right. And we heard that with BTK Dennis Rader would say that often when he would go out and he would kill somebody or kill multiple people, 
He felt like in the, the first 48 hours afterwards that the police were just going to show up at any time at his door knocking and saying, hey, we know what you did, buddy. Yeah. Now you're arrested. It's like this paranoia sets in. Yeah, that's interesting. And so Ed said that in that situation, he was going to shoot and kill anyone that would have approached the the farm or the house at that time. That was his mindset at the time. So we almost have to count our blessings here in some form, right? Because he's out on a 17 acre farm out in kind of the middle of nowhere. If he were in a major city when he had done this, can you imagine all the innocent people that weren't coming to get him that would have probably have been killed that day? I mean, you even something as simple as the person delivering the mail. Right. You but know, then we'd have a scenario where it would be, He'd be a mass murderer and they would have caught him. And then the other, the serial killings would have never happened. Well, mm, that's tough to say. That's tough to say. Uh, it's not tough to say when I, I, what I'm assuming is that in the sixties, 64, if you had a guy that went on a rampage going around and killing people in a city that the cops were going to come and arrest that individual. Yes. But, Essentially, isn't that what ended up happening? And what I mean by that is that, okay, so we get lucky that there's nobody else there. And at some point, his paranoia, it it wears off. And he calls his mother and explains what he had done. And he is going to be picked up. Like you said, he gets arrested for killing his grandparents. Right. Kemper was committed to the Atescadero State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. All right, Captain, I want to let everybody out there know I received a lot of great emails, several people asking about specific cases to cover. I mentioned a few of them here. One, the Honey and Barry Sherman case, the Tika Lewis case, the Amy Mahalovic case, and Laura Spirier. I want to point out that we did cover all of these cases already, and you can find all of our back catalog. It's a huge back catalog. We're over 260 episodes strong now. You can get our back catalog for free and listen to those cases on the Stitcher app. We also have a show on Stitcher Premium called Off the Record. It's $5 a month, and you get every premium show on Stitcher Premium. All right, we will talk more Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, tomorrow back here in the garage. Until then, everybody, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can live out your MasterChef dream when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.